All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Hari Kanan. I work for VMware. Uh, I'm joined here with my colleagues, uh, Giri and Mayan, uh, who do the actual work. So they'll probably get into a little bit more details. I'll set the stage, what we are trying to do here, and uh, we'll go from there. I think the purpose of this uh, session is to discuss how we adapted OpenStack to provide a enterprise-grade Kubernetes distribution on vSphere SDT stack. That's the primary purpose of what we were trying to do, to use OpenStack to run on the vSphere NSX uh, LAN. But then we will extend this to support other clouds, such as AWS and uh, Azure and uh, other things in future. But the primary purpose of this exercise and this talk is to describe how we adapted OpenStack for uh, uh, the NSX vSphere LAN. So that's the primary purpose. Standard stuff, uh, you know, some of this, uh, as VMware, we are allowed to, not allowed to discuss in terms of uh, futures, products. So let's get the basics out of the way. Most of you are familiar with what Kubernetes is. Um, I don't think we need to explain, but just to get a level set the conversation here. So we have a bunch of uh, master nodes uh, uh, that run the base core services for Kubernetes. Uh, the controller, API service, etcd, uh, scheduler, those run on the master nodes. Uh, we spin up uh, the master nodes as VMs running on any hypervisor. Um, and then you have the worker nodes where you have the kubelets and the proxy servers. That is something that you scale in and out depending on the size of the cluster as well. So this is just some basics, uh, levels of the conversation. Most of you here are familiar with it, but this is kind of the deployment profile that we are looking at in the uh, end state. Deployment is probably something that will look similar to this. So as a product manager, typically we start thinking about um, what are the uh, personas that are involved whenever we try to build a product. So the mileage might vary uh, from company to company. There is no one uh, standard uh, set of personas, but we try to identify uh, capabilities and roles based on some of the personas that we have a conversation with. And as you are pretty familiar, primary audience for what we had been historically building and selling has been the IT admin community. So as a cloud administrator, um, there is a responsibility for any organization in a, for a cloud administrator, and the role is evolving. But pr fundamentally, this person is responsible for uh, defining the, uh, or rather determining which particular cloud or which particular environment. He, most developers typically don't care whether it's running on AWS. I'm, most of our product that we are building is in the enterprise context, and we are not looking at uh, primarily targeting you know, the, uh, the startups that are pretty, pretty much running uh, pretty, all their operations on AWS or Azure or any of the Google or any of the cloud properties. We are primarily focusing on data centers in ent large enterprises, the, the, uh, the banks, the financial institutions, and so on. So those are the type of uh, customers that we go after. And there, there is a defined role called cloud administrator who is more responsible for defining, OK, I'm going to run in this data center versus another one, or probably combine it with a public cloud. So the cl cloud administrator has uh, so some roles, and then he creates various projects for different uh, lines of businesses, or various initiatives, project A, project B, or maybe even um, you know uh, def defining for different lines of businesses. That's one role. And then the right side, that's from a provider perspective, we look at those roles. And from a consumer perspective, or the consumption side, you have these two roles. Some of many organizations combine those roles, but some of them keep them separate, the DevOps admin and then the developer. So the developer primarily doesn't care uh, where, where his uh, uh, apps run by and large, but definitely for a dev test, we have seen various environments being used, but he's more interested in the consumption of the software, not in the actual infrastructure layer going forward. And then there are two. Uh, consumption models, again, it is a maturity curve that we have seen. Many customers start with you know, elemental container provisioning, mostly from their Mac, uh, or running some uh, simple Docker Compose. And then they, as they are comfortable, as they start building real-life applications, they start moving into complex uh, 
stacks like you know use docker swarm kubernetes is now the de facto container orchestration platform so that's uh, what motivated us to start building what we just will will be talking in the rest of the presentation but ma many of them start on the left side i want to build uh, deploy my own kubernetes cluster and then i want to um, try my application that's many customers try to do that and then there is a more mature model where I don't care too much about the actual deployment of Kubernetes. Um, I would just start building my applications, give me an endpoint, I will use kubectl and other things that I would like to start uh, building my applications. I don't care too much on how the Kubernetes itself is instantiated. So those are two deployment models that we have seen and uh, initial product that we are building is again going back to who our primary customer base is, which is the IT department in a shared, uh, shared, sh shared environment providing to multiple lines of businesses and different projects. We are focusing more on the right side for now and then we'll be addressing the needs of the left side as well. So when we started uh, doing this project uh, sometime in uh, fall of last year, we decided, okay, you know, the question, natural question that comes to everybody's mind is, okay, what is the big deal? You know, Kubernetes, people know how there are five different ways to stand up a Kubernetes. What is so uh, difficult or what, I mean, 2017, is it still a big problem for us? And it turns out, actually, there are some challenges, and uh, here are some of the specific things we identified, right? The first thing is, the, what I just said, which is there are numerous ways to do it, and while these things are work, and by and large, uh, a, a, many companies and many uh, teams have adapted it, the customers that we typically go after, the enterprises, are looking for a more prescriptive enterprise-grade capability for Kubernetes, and many of our customers are actually looking for a, a enterprise-grade uh, Kubernetes on the vSphere NSX, uh, the, what we, VMware calls a SDDC stack, software defined data center stack. So that is actually, there's no one way to do it, there's no authoritative way to do it. So that becomes actually a bit of an interesting problem. There are five different ways, which is a good, prob good problem to have, but yet there is no prescriptive authoritative way to do this. So that was number one issue and we said, okay, we will come in and we will define a, a more standardized way to deploy Kubernetes. And then there are a few other interesting challenges that we found, which is, okay, in a, in a KVM environment, you can set up a GlusterFS or a Ceph or a, any other shared storage. Um, but in, in a VMware stack, those capabilities are not very mature or not well defined. That means we had to find a way to support persistent volume. So that is another challenge that we had to overcome. And then you had another few other issues such as, you know, there are multiple open source uh, uh, container networking technologies. You know, you have Flannel, Calico, and, and so on, but nobody has uh, provided a, a easy way for all of this to be stitched together and deploy for a customer and be, uh, be supported as well. And uh, it, within our own company, the, the, the NSX, which is our uh, lead flagship uh, SDN solution, had started working on uh, building a container networking capability, and then we wanted to make sure that we can integrate that as well. And the other thing is while uh, some of the uh, open source as well as NSX had started working on um, even pod level micro segmentation, uh, which is another key requirement enterprise customers were asking for, the, we had to stitch uh, multiple layers, both VM level mic uh, micro segmentation as well as pod level micro segmentation becomes an interesting problem and we wanted to have a single stack that would provide uh, both these capabilities for our customers. So these problems started uh, creeping up and, and for example, if I want to, um, stand up a service um, as a Kubernetes service, then I had to figure a way out to set up a load balancer. Again, this becomes, there are some Nginx or HA proxy based load balancer, but uh, yet at the same time, we had a prescriptive way to set up and the NSX has a load balancer and how to stand up a load balancer that customers are using elsewhere in the same Kubernetes context as well. And then there was no defined way to um, run in 1.6 of Kubernetes. There is a lot of improvements with respect to RBAC, 
<laughs> but, but when we started sometime in the fall of last year, we didn't really have a very authoritative way to do R back in Kubernetes. There are some homegrown solutions, but the integration with LDAP uh, or any AD or LDAP, which is a key requirement for any corporate environment, was not well defined. And again, the notion of authentication and authorization was not well defined either. So someone has to uh, stitch these things together. So these are some of the specific challenges in terms of multi-tenancy, LBAS, uh, micro-segmentation, container networking, all these things were uh, turning out to be a bit of a challenge, and especially in the context of running it in the vSphere uh, NSX context, and hence we started doing this. And it, soon we realized that in order for us to stitch all these individual components together, you, there is a notion of how do I spin up a VM, how do I spin up a network, and how do I spin up a bunch of storage de uh, devices, and this, this has a name, right? I mean, this is nothing but an IaaS capability, and Kubernetes has built uh, plugins to various IaaS capabilities, and we realized that actually OpenStack is the right platform to do that. So we started uh, uh, using OpenStack, and the very first version of OpenStack uh, integration that we did for, for uh, actually supporting Kubernetes on VMware stack had we used the full-fledged OpenStack. While that was very useful and some of our customers, OpenStack customers loved it, the feedback that we received was, hey, you know, um, OpenStack is great. I, if I have needs to run uh, parallel, in parallel stacks, both VMs and Kubernetes, that works fine. But if I'm just doing a separate project to run Kubernetes, I don't want to get the overhead of OpenStack. And that's what set us uh, in a slightly different path early this year. And we started figuring out how to build a thin IaaS, uh, which based on OpenStack, and figure out how to deploy an enterprise-grade Kubernetes using uh, OpenStack, but very stripped down version, taking only the minimum components and uh, still be able to provide a Kubernetes distribution. So that is where I think we'll spend the rest of the uh, con uh, presentation today on uh, explaining what we did to strip down uh, OpenStack to its bare minimum and be able to stand up a Kubernetes deployment for, uh, for a VMware stack. So uh, again, the last thing I would want to say is, while this is how we started to provide an OpenStack uh, based uh, Kubernetes. You can have either a full-fledged OpenStack if you are an existing OpenStack customer or you, your use cases require both spinning up VMs as well as uh, uh, containers, then we, we support both models. But in future, we also plan to support um, other um, cloud providers such as AWS, Google, and so on. So that is the, the Product is architected in, in a way where you can, it has cleanly ab abstracted both the infrastructure layer and the Kubernetes control uh, manage, lifecycle management so that you, you can keep adding uh, other cloud providers as we proceed. So with that, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, one of our key developers for this project and he can explain a little bit more in detail on how we took the full open stack stripped it down to its minimum and we be able to provide a sort of an appliance model to stand up a Kubernetes distribution. Giri? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Hari. Hey. Uh, my name is Giri. I'm, I work with Mayan and Hari as part of the cloud management business unit at VMware. Um, so as Hari mentioned, um, one of the things that we realized uh, while building the Kubernetes um, product was there's a need for an infrastructure as a service layer um, that offers multi-tenancy that has a that provides the capability to bring together compute networking and storage and uh, you know provides an interface that's well adopted within the uh, community that also works with uh, kubernetes in, uh, in a way that <coughs> leverage the kubernetes cloud provider portion of it and also provide a way to deploy the kubernetes nodes in a much reliable fashion um, so that's the first part. So one thing where the infrastructure provider helps is to deploy the Kubernetes nodes, uh, the master nodes and the, the worker nodes, uh, provide high availability, and provide a, you know, a reliable way to upgrade Kubernetes also. So all this 
capabilities are offered by the infrastructure provider. So that's the first aspect of it. And uh, we also need, as part of day to operations, we also want to provide auto scaling, uh, provide an ability to resize the clusters. And this is something uh, the infrastructure provider is handling that. And the second part of it is Kubernetes has very well defined interfaces that works with different cloud providers. Um, that provides you um, some of the services like, uh, I'm going to jump on there, for example, load balancer and a persistent volume, and also have authentication and authorization. These are, there are like interfaces well defined in Kubernetes, and we wanted to support that and, uh, using this infrastructure provider. So here is an example where there's a service being deployed, and one of the uh, requirements as part of deploying the service is to have an external load balancer. And uh, we are leveraging this infrastructure provider to you know, offer this as part of the service deployment. And the other important aspect of it is when you are deploying a pod and you're looking for a persistent volume, and we need an ability to deploy uh, you know, uh, a backend uh, that is from VMware and you know, other multiple, I mean, cloud providers, and also have an ability to move around. So when a pod is moving from one virtual machine to the other, we need an ability so that it can be, uh, whenever Kubernetes reschedules this pod, we want this volume to be move along with that. Right. So now uh, let's double click on the very specific infrastructure provider. As Harry mentioned, we are, you know, uh, we want to support multiple providers. The number one priority is VMware uh, SDDC stack, and we obviously uh, are supporting OpenStack, and we also want to move towards like Azure and AWS in future, right? Um, so as part of the SDDC provider, so what we are supporting for networking is uh, the legacy VMware distributed switch um, that offers you very rich L2 and L3 capabilities. And we are also supporting the NSX vSphere. Uh, we are leveraging NSX vSphere for L2, L3, load balance as a service, uh, and uh, you know, security group, which is a micro segmentation for all these control plane nodes. Uh, we are leveraging that. And you might have heard about NSXT, which is a brand new uh, or an enhanced platform coming from uh, the VMware Networking and Security Business Unit, and it offers multi-hypervisor support. Basically, you can have both VMware ESX and KVM, and it offers, it's very rich in, in the container um, network solution. It offers micro-segmentation both at a virtual machine level and at, at the pod level. So we are giving multiple choices here. I mean, one of the key takeaways is, like, if you are using this, uh, the Kubernetes distribution, you have a choice to go with a legacy networking using the distributed switch or a full-fledged NSX vSphere. Or if you're looking for some advanced container level network on, you know, configuration, you can go on with NSXT also. Um, another aspect of uh, VMware SDTC stack is it provides a very nice abstraction for the storage backends in the form of VMFS. And we support NFS, iSCSI, vWall, and vSAN, all these different um, types and we support that in the, as part of the VMware SDTC stack. And the other capability uh, that we have as part of this distribution is um, the multi vCenter support. Let's say we want to have high availability, or, or if you want to scale out, add more compute node, and expand your, uh, the Kubernetes cluster nodes, then we also have offer this multiple uh, vCenter support. So you can scale out uh, you know, depending on your demand. So in order to provide this uh, infrastructure uh, as a service, uh, and vCenter and NSX by itself is not multi-tenant capable and they don't you know, come with a default uh, IAS. Um, so what we wanted to do was leverage OpenStack for that. And VMware, uh, already we ship VMware integrated OpenStack, which is proven to be like, very simple to deploy and it gives a very nice story about upgrade and other things. And our thought was like, why not leverage OpenStack for doing this? Because it already stitches together the entire VMware stack. It takes vCenter, NSX, vSAN, it stitches them together and it provides a nice multi-tenant IIS capabilities. We wanted to take that, and first thing is we containerize all the bare minimum services that we need for uh, the Kubernetes. We picked Keystone, uh, Nova, Cinder, Glance, and Neutron. So we took these core services and we packaged them as Docker containers, and we put them all in a in a OVA because that's a very common workflow for any you know, VMware admin is to deploy uh, a OVA. 
So we package them as containers, and then we run inside a virtual machine, and that's how um, you know the thin IIS is offered. And the workflow would be something like um, you create a provider. In this case, it will be a VMware SDDC provider. And once that is deployed, you can deploy the Kubernetes cluster, depending on the number of master nodes and the worker nodes that you want. And we also work with uh, an existing uh, IDM. One of the things that we are leveraging today is Keystone um, that works with, I mean, like that offers multiple domain. Basically, you can have an LDAP backend or a SQL backend. Uh, and uh, basically, we leverage that and then provide this IDM capabilities. And we also hook that with the namespace concept in, in Kubernetes. So that's one of the important plumbing that we have done. So we use Keystone for authentication and authorization. So we plumb the namespace concept in Kubernetes with Keystone. So if, let's say you have a namespace, we map that to a project on, on Keystone so that no uh, users from different tenants would be able to access pods and other services from, you know, uh, from other uh, namespaces. Right. Um, this is how the uh, overall network topology will look like. Uh, we provide, again, clear network isolation for both um, the management plane, control plane, and finally for the applications also. They have their own load balancer. They can leverage um, uh, the LBAS V2 is what some, something we are using for, uh, uh, for the load balancer, and we are using um, that for both the control plane uh, when we are deploying multiple master nodes in order to provide high availability, we are deploying, we are leveraging the LBAS V2 uh, to get the load balancer, and we use the same thing on the cloud provider side for the, all the uh, services that are deployed on the Kubernetes. And while deploying Kubernetes, upgrading is all, you know, it's very important. But the other, the most important aspect of uh, uh, running Kubernetes in production is about uh, the day to operation. So we offer ability to resize the cluster and you know add some key pairs and all these capabilities are built in as part of this product. Right. As I mentioned, we are using Keystone for, uh, um, for IDM and we also have plans to integrate with the, the VMware IDM, the, the native VIDM. And um, yeah, with that, we'll switch to uh, the demo and mine will take over. Thank you. Uh, any questions before we jump onto the demo? What do you want to do now? jump to the demo and, and take the questions from there. Okay, um, so we talked about a lot of slides and, oh, okay. Probably need to do this before I do it. Yeah. Okay, so as Giri said, um, deployment of this is Pretty simple, it's an OVA file, it's a pretty standard uh, deployment for anybody that used to work with the uh, vCenter. Um, the steps that you need to do is, again, straightforward, just select the cluster that uh, of VMs that you want to, uh, of a host that you want to work with, select the data store, give some uh, static IPs and IP ranges for this to, uh, to leverage, and that's pretty much it um, with regards to what is required. Um, we can see here that uh, we create in this uh, uh, this VM, and uh, once we power it on, uh, we get the IP in order to log in into this uh, uh, solution. Um, once we log in, we can see that we have those two concepts that we talked about. These are the providers and the cluster. Let's start with the deploying a, a SDDC provider, VMware SDDC provider. Uh, we offer the, uh, uh, obviously the option to uh, load from file if you saved the uh, previous deployments or uh, if you failed on the first one and want to do uh, a new one. Uh, select the, give it a name and a type. Again, things are, are pretty straightforward here on the deployment part. Uh, select the vCenter on which you want to uh, deploy uh, uh, and, and use as a provider. Select the, the NSX manager that you want to use in order for uh, provide your network uh, capabilities, and that's pretty much uh, it over here as well. Um, in this demo, we show in uh, uh, NSXV uh, um, uh, usage. Um, on the back end here, we're doing a lot of uh, 
configuration and basically spinning up uh, uh, this uh, thin IIS, thin, uh, thin uh, OpenStack that we've talked about, configuring it, making sure it knows how to uh, work with the different uh, uh, underlying infrastructure. And once this is done, uh, we're, we have our provider ready for uh, deploying some uh, Kubernetes clusters on top of that. Deploying the clusters uh, is seamless in the sense of it doesn't really matter which provider you have underneath that, if that's going to be an OpenStack or SDDC one, it's going to be the same. You just select the provider, give it a name, how many master nodes, how many worker nodes you want for this uh, cluster to have, um, the repository to use for uh, different configuration, and again, quite straightforward, quite easy to, uh, to achieve. Once we're doing this, on the back end, you can see on the left side, different things are going to happen now. We're going to create the right networks. We're going to create the load balancers. We're going to create the right VMs for this. Everything that was asked as part of this creation of the cluster, all the stitching that needs to happen if, we, if there's a, 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 a persistent volume that you need, then it's going to be part of this. And once you have that, everything's going to be ready. Uh, again, we're fasting forward here, obviously. Um, but you can see in a minute that some of the VMs going to create it. You can see on the bottom side that uh, we're creating a, um, all the networks and, and stitching that needs to happen. And once this is ready, um, let's give it another second. <clears throat> Once this thing is ready, uh, we're going to get the uh, Kubernetes endpoint that as an administrator I'm going to pass on to my developers or my uh, DevOps manager, depends on, on the organization. And this is pretty much uh, for the developer, this is a regular Kubernetes deployment, you can use it and you can manage it from, from uh, your tools that you use to do that. Before we can do that, we actually need to uh, create some users and, uh, uh, and uh, permissions for that. So in this, we, we've seen a SQL uh, uh, backend, so we need to actually create the user. So we create two users, we're going to create Joe and Tom. Uh, if you have LDAP integration, obviously you don't need to do any of this, and we do not, you don't want to do it from here. The LDAP is going to take care of all the users, and all you'll need to do is the next step, which is for a specific uh, Kubernetes cluster, we're going to create namespace and going to assign the users they're going to use. So we're going to create here two different namespaces. One is the Palo Alto one, and we're going to have Joe assigned to that. And the other one's going to be a Beijing one uh, namespace, and we're going to add um, Tom to that uh, uh, namespace. And now let's jump to the developer itself. This is a Tom's, uh, sorry, this is Joe's uh, uh, laptop, and he's going to do, uh, you can say this is the context of Joe, and he's uh, using the uh, Palo Alto namespace for the cluster that we've created. You can see there are no pods and no services here. Um, we're going to use a guest house, regular, uh, pretty uh, standard guest house. Uh, uh, YAML file for Kubernetes deployment, uh, and you can see on the bottom here that uh, one of the requirements that we get here is to create a load balancer for this uh, uh, for this application. So let's deploy this. Again, this is, as you can see, uh, Kubecato, the regular way to use your uh, Kubernetes. We're deploying this uh, on the back end. This is going creating the pods on the VMs, that, the worker VMs that we have for that cluster. Um, we can see here the different pods are running, and we can see the services are uh, being built, the different networking. You can see we're still pending on the front end in order to get the external IP. What happens in the back end is that we're going to the NSX asking for create a load balancer over there. And uh, once this is there, it's there, you can see that 
Uh, he has a load balancer as an, a, as an entry point for the front end. Uh, and again, this is all being done automatically on the behind the scenes, all the configuration is being done. You can see the uh, uh, 192, 168, 112, there is the external uh, IP for this specific environment. Uh, one more thing I wanna show you here is um, if we jump to uh, the Tom context, okay, the other developer, and in this context, he is, it's Tom. Uh, if you remember, he belongs to the Beijing namespace. Uh, but he's gonna try to use the Palo Alto namespace here. And he's gonna try to um, um, look into the infrastructure, to the uh, different deployment and, and try to uh, play with it. And you can see that he's getting denied. The way we do it is actually having uh, aligning the namespace with the uh, keystone concepts and for projects and then once he's denied with a project, he's denied with a namespace specifically. Um, one more thing we're gonna show here is scaling up. Uh, you can see there's one, in, uh, one master and one worker nodes. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, to scale up this into uh, three worker nodes kind of a, a cluster. And again, uh, you can see on the back end in, in uh, vSphere that we've created the different nodes over there and scaling up is just as simple as that. Okay. All the networking, all the, everything that needs to happen on the back seat, uh, on, on behind the scenes uh, happening there and you got this. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, if you got any questions, uh, please uh, use the mics here because this is being recorded. Uh, we'll be happy to take it. I had a question. So just want to make sure I understand the controller, like the management interface that you're building, is it based on something like is the plugin to be realized or is it a custom development that you guys created or what, what is, is it open source? Uh, the, the provider? The screen where you say yeah. add cluster, add provider. Oh, that, that's so the that part going to be part of, of uh, the solution we, we're doing. Uh, you are probably going to change, obviously. This is a... a very first uh, uh, preliminary uh, stages, um, but this is going to be part of the solution. Um, so it is built. Yeah, yeah it is being built as an independent service. Uh, we haven't decided whether it will be shipped primarily as an independent solution, or for sure it will be uh, bundled with both our uh, OpenStack distribution as well as the VRealize solution for sure but whether it will be a separate package or not, we haven't defined yet. The, as regards to the open source part of it, uh, la, so some of the components that we build already, like the UI layer, we are gonna uh, integrate with something called Admiral, which is our open source uh, container management uh, interface. That's already an open source project. A lot of it will be continue, we'll continue to open source most of what we did. Again, I wanna emphasize here that uh, what we saw, what we demonstrated here is primarily to support the VMware um, stack which has some ch additional or different challenges than running uh, Kubernetes on a, v a KVM stack. So that, that is our primary use case that we are addressing here, but we are using op open stack to address those challenges. So the uh, plugin that we use, Cinder plugin, we are using Cinder plugin for persistent store, key store for authentication. We are using uh, NSX load balancer through Neutron. So those are how we integrated OpenStack seamlessly into this project. Any other questions? Is, is this available, uh, the appliance for distilling development? It is, uh, we actually would have gone beta as of yesterday, so we, we, you should be able to try it out in beta uh, sometime this week. Okay, right, thank you. Uh, can you install this on an existing VIO installation for one? Yes, absolutely, yes. Uh, we, you, uh, if you go back to the provider model, uh, can you just, do you have the slides? How do I go back? Uh, Back. 
Yeah, so if you go back to the slide, uh, you can see that there are two, uh, out of the four models that you have, there are two that I would like to call your attention to, right? First, uh, what, if you don't have a full-fledged open stack, including Vio, then we will take this thin appliance installed as a single VM, and every OpenStack service that we need is running as a container. We will just uh, plug it in like an appliance. The, you don't really need to install the full-blown OpenStack. But if you have an existing OpenStack deployment, uh, right now we have certified or rather tested with only our version of OpenStack, uh, which is VIO. But it, technically there is really no limitation because at the end of the day we use our OpenStack is as uh, open or rather it exposes the same interfaces as any other OpenStack and we don't use any exotic projects. So we just use the basic project, Keystone, Nova, Cinder, Glance, those are the core projects is what we are using. So we should be able to plug it into the uh, existing OpenStack uh, environment as well. But current testing has been done only with ours but we don't see any reason why it should not work with any other OpenStack. Any other questions? So, uh, just to clarify, the, is the Kubernetes running on uh, bare metal instances or, or on VMs? Or? Yes, uh, and the answer is no, they are not running on uh, bare metal, they are running only on VMs. Um, so the way it works is we spin up a bunch of VMs for the master node. Uh, ma for the master nodes, we spin a bunch of VMs on vSphere uh, NSX and maybe if we had the time we would have gone into a little bit more detail. So we use a Terraform template to spin up, uh, to talk to OpenStack to spin up the control planes. So the VMs both, uh, I mean the, both the control plane and the worker nodes, they're all spun up as uh, OpenStack VMs. They are OpenStack payloads that we use standard OpenStack uh, Terraform templates to spin them up. And somebody can use that OpenStack just like I mean, uh, a normal user, right? Uh, the, are these, can, can you, do you have any stitching for an application that's running? So, well, as you can see in the demo, you deploy it, you don't really have the notion of I'm deploying an open stack here, right? Uh, the, we just spin up a provider there, it's all being, uh, being encapsulated into the scripts and all the things we're doing behind the scenes in order for reduce the amount of, of manageability that's required for, uh, for this. So we do, we, in the thin IaaS model, we have one uh, admin account that will be the one that's spinning up the control planes. And so if you are a regular user, you don't have access to those VMs because you don't, you can't go through your Horizon or Keystone unless you are that user. I was referring to a hybrid application, not those VMs, but some other VMs that you want yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends on, it's, it's ba basically we are using neutron networks. So any network that you can use, we should be able to, uh, that, that's how we use the product. So if you, if you have an overlay, then it's all limited to that particular tenant. You don't really have access outside of it. Uh, what's the question more on, um, can you use a thin IAS to deploy regular VMs without? Uh, yeah, and, and applications that require a mix of containers and VMs, where you... Yeah, take, I mean, it's not just containers, like can we also deploy regular VMs if, if it's not open stack so, way, I mean, that, that is doable too, technically, yeah. yeah. But it's more focused on deploying the Kubernetes control plane at this point. One more question, uh, which version of um, Kubernetes do you install? One so right now we have the beta version we started a little before 1.6 came out, so we are using 1.5, but when we plan to release this in the next few months, we will be actually switching to 1.6. And uh, upcoming um, upgrades, how many up versions do you, are you gonna support? Those are things that we haven't defined. I mean, uh, I would go back to the same model that we have for OpenStack, right? Uh, I think for OpenStack, we current version supports even kilo version of OpenStack. We support our customers. 
I think the most re uh, recent version we, that we support is we, we currently on, on Mitaka, we skip yeah. in every release, but we see from customers that we're that run in our uh, environment, they're also on Kilo and they're not rushing out into upgrade. So as Harry said, we haven't defined exactly how we're gonna support different versions, uh, but we do anticipate a kind of a similar requirement from customers. Uh, for new customers, definitely want a latest and greatest. For existing customers, usually they're already deployed, things are working, they're not rushing out that fast to upgrade. So again, it depends on customer demands and, and we'll support what's needed. Any other questions? No, oh, out of time? Okay. No, maybe. Uh, All right, okay. thank you thank for you your very time. Much. Uh, let us know if you need any other questions offline. Thank you.